Once upon a time, a mathematician named Euclid dreamed of a system of geometry only constructed by a compass and a ruler. He believed all geometric objects could be made using these tools and five apparent truths. Between any two points, you can always draw a straight line. Any line segment can be extended to an arbitrarily long line. Every circle with a given center and radius length can be drawn with the compass. All right angles measure the same. And if a line intersects two other lines and the internal angles on the same side add up to less than 180 degrees, then the two lines must intersect. Together these statements are Euclid's five postulates, and this last fifth postulate caused a lot of trouble. Let's rephrase it using the first four postulates to make it easier to understand. Given a line and a point not on that line, there is a unique second line which passes through the point and does not intersect the first line. This is also known as the parallel postulate. Euclid's fifth postulate seemed too complicated to accept as fact without proof, so for the next 2,000 years many mathematicians tried to prove it from the other four. None succeeded. But little did these mathematicians know, nature already knew of their failure. On sea cucumbers and holly leaves, cuttlefish and kale, there lurked a mathematical world where infinite pairs of parallel lines were possible, a world we call hyperbolic geometry. So for centuries after Euclid, mathematicians across the world tried to prove Euclid's fifth postulate using the first four. Um, most notably, this was done in the Islamic world uh, with mathematicians Ibn al-Haytham, Omar Khayyam, and al-Tusi. So what these mathematicians did was uh, they started with one line, which we're going to call L, um, and then they said let's have a point outside that line called A. So Euclid's fifth postulate says that we can always find a line through the point A that doesn't intersect the line L. Um, so, like, maybe about, about like that, if I'm just guesstimating. Um, but the, uh, so what these mathematicians were trying to do was think about in what ways can Euclid's fifth postulate fail and then prove that those situations can't happen. So one way that it could fail is that we can't find a line that passes through A that does not intersect L, and that would mean that all lines through the point A would kind of curve in towards L, looking something like this. Um, but on the other hand, it could fail if there's not exactly one line. So if there's many, and this would mean that we could sort of take the line passing through A and rotate it, and it still would not intersect the line L, um, and so in that, that way that would mean that the line would sort of have to curve away from L. So something just like this. These mathematicians were trying to prove that neither, neither of these cases could happen by using generalized quadrilaterals where some of the angles were unknown. Um, but little did they know that they were actually writing the first theorems on hyperbolic geometry. So we can even see right here um, that our flat piece of paper is divided into grid squares. And um, let's take a look at around a single vertex. There's four squares meeting that point. So I'll just highlight here. So we have four squares around a point. And we might think that this is the only option when we're fitting squares together, is you have to have four to make a complete circle. And if you were to think that, you'd be just like Euclid here, our friend Euclid who's trapped in the flat plane. But in reality, if we live in three dimensions, we can think beyond just four squares. So here we have our four squares, and we can just take a snip here. And if we live in three dimensions, which conveniently is the case, um, we can actually fit another square in. So I'm just going to bring this up into the third dimension, and then I can just slide another square in the gap here. 
and we'll just tape these together. Alrighty. Okay, so um, we're gonna draw a line, a straight line on this surface. Um, so here we go, this is our line L. And let's say that this point off here, off the line, is our point A. Okay. And I can draw a straight line through the point A that doesn't intersect L. Easy peasy. Okay. So here's a straight line that passes through the point A, but it doesn't intersect L. Right? And there's that's one option, but I can draw another one if I want. So here I've just drawn another purple line through that point A. And if we keep on adding more and more squares to this plane, eventually A will get taken far, far away from the line L. Um, so these two, these two lines will not intersect. Even though based on their angles in a flat plane, maybe they would intersect. So this example right here is maybe not quite what we're looking for when we're looking for a surface with hyperbolic geometry because it's divided into flat squares and we've got some edges and cone points and maybe we want something smooth. But if we do this with smaller and smaller squares, then we begin to approximate that kind of surface that we want. Um, so maybe that might look something like this. So right here I've done a similar, a similar action with taping five squares together around a point. I've done it with crochet and it makes a smoother surface that, that is, a, is a model for a surface with hyperbolic geometry. But what is hyperbolic geometry? Well, the next stage of our history is all about that question. We now come to the 1820s and Euclid's grasp on geometry is starting to weaken. On one hand, we have Gauss, building on work by Euler, who is calculating the curvature of spheres. And Gauss knew about surfaces with positive curvature, like spheres. Uh, he knew about surfaces with zero curvature, like a flat plane. And he surmised that there must also be surfaces with negative curvature, but he didn't know what they would look like. On the other hand, Nikolai Lobachevsky and Janos Bulia were studying a system of axioms that Lobachevsky called imaginary geometry. Later, it would come to be known as hyperbolic geometry. They took Euclid's framework and considered what would happen without that problematic parallel postulate. Gauss had actually thought about these ideas as well, but he decided never to publish his work on it. In 1854, Riemann entered the scene, and he combined these two separate ideas. Riemann described how hyperbolic geometry would be the intrinsic geometry of a surface with constant negative curvature extended infinitely in all directions. This ushered in a new age of studying hyperbolic surfaces, with the pseudosphere, the Poincaré disk model, and many more. Many mathematicians searched for an easy way to describe hyperbolic surfaces, like they could do for planes or spheres. But in 1901, David Hilbert dismantled hope and proved that there is no equation in three dimensions to describe a surface with constant negative curvature extending infinitely in all directions. Even though this destroyed the quest for an equation, there is still a possibility of making models of the hyperbolic plane. Bill Thurston famously made a model with curved strips of paper in the 1970s, and his work paved the way for crocheted hyperbolic creatures to sneak in. In the late 1990s, Dinah Tamina was seeking a clear way to teach hyperbolic geometry to her university students. And then she realized Thurston's method would work with crochet. She was able to make tactile models that would let her students experience hyperbolic geometry in the same way that a sheet of paper can model Euclidean geometry. So here I have uh, Dinah's book. And this is kind of the inspira this is the inspiration for this whole video. Honestly, I received this book as a gift last year and I've had a lot of fun learning how to crochet from it and learning all about hyperbolic spaces. In 
if I were to start crocheting a square, um, I would just start with a chain. And for those non-crocheters, this is just a, well, it's just a chain of stitches, just like what you might think, a line of stitches. So I'm gonna represent that with a bunch of loop-de-loops. Okay, so that's my beginning chain. And then the next row that I do, I'm just going to add one stitch above each stitch in the last row. And I just keep on doing this to make a square. If I were to do this in actuality, I would get something like this little square with nice stitches in a grid. right? And we can draw the straight lines in in this diagram just by following a line of stitches upwards. So there's one straight line and here's another straight line. Okay, so this is a very Euclidean crochet. Um, okay, so now let's draw a hyperbolic crochet. What does that look like? Oh my gosh. So um, for hyperbolic crochet you use something called a stitch increase, which is where each row you increase the amount of stitches in your row. Um, so I'm just going to start with one stitch right here and if I start with one then the next row I'm going to put two stitches in that one in my last row so now I'm going to do two and then the next row I do I double that again so I put two stitches in each stitch in my previous row so I have four stitches okay and then I just continue this pattern I have no idea if that's the right amount of stitches, but we'll just pretend it is. <laughs> you can see how this explodes really fast. I mean, that's just exponential growth for you. Um, suddenly we have our crochet, our row is going to take forever to crochet. Um, so most of the time I don't do a, a double increase for each row. Um, I've taken the habit of doing, I believe, what is it? A four to three ratio. So here we have a one to one ratio. There's a uh, same number of stitches in the next row as the previous one. Here we have a two to one ratio. So there's double the amount of stitches in the last row. So, um, so I typically do a four to three ratio. I um, mean, you can see that this ratio has a shallower increase than this one over here. Uh, so that just makes it so it, it doesn't take as long to crochet each row uh, sequentially. I'm gonna do one more row here. How do we actually make these different stitch ratios? Well, we can vary the frequency of the stitch increases. If we're doing a two to one ratio, then every stitch will have two new stitches attached to it. But if we're doing a four to three ratio, for every three stitches in one row, we want there to be four in the next row. So we can do a pattern of two stitches, one stitch, one stitch, two stitches, one stitch, one stitch. If we wanted to do a ratio of three to two, then we could do a pattern of two stitches, one stitch, two stitches, one stitch, and that would get us there. But now we can highlight our straight lines on these diagrams. So here we have Maybe one straight line going here. And then this one we have a straight line going here. And then over here we have a straight line. This one goes whoosh, just like that. <laughs> and this one, straight line this way. Um, so you can see even from this picture how in hyperbolic geometry our straight lines have to curve away from each other. Um, so here I have our little friend we are looking at already. So this one I believe has a ratio of six to five. Let's take a look at a flat piece of paper. If we want to look at those straight lines, we just fold it in half. So if you want to find a straight line on a flat piece of paper, you just make a fold anywhere and uh, that gives you a straight line. Um, and the same is true for a model of hyperbolic space. So we could just take this model and then we could fold it and that right there, that gives us a straight line. And you can even see we could fold it like this way actually too, and that gives us a circle. But on the hyperbolic plane, that's a straight line. It's just a fold. 
By folding our hyperbolic plane and marking those lines with stitches, we can see that hyperbolic geometry solves the millennia-old problem of the parallel postulate. So here we have a line L made by folding our hyperbolic plane, and we can choose a point off that line, which we're going to call A. And now here we have two lines passing through that point A that do not intersect L. Euclid built an axiomatic system of geometry from observing the world around him. By transforming the study of space into an abstract geometry, he made room for later mathematicians to imagine the impossible, infinitely many parallel lines. And hyperbolic geometry was synonymous with imaginary. But mathematicians are people, and people live in a physical world. When the hyperbolic plane is in our hands, born out of paper or yarn, the imaginary becomes real, the impossible becomes possible. If you guys would like to see the crochet pieces that I've made more in depth, then head on over to the other video that I posted. Also, there might be some tutorials coming if there is interest from you all. But thank you so much for watching this video, and as always, keep exploring.